I'm going to call this meeting to order. We want to welcome everyone to this May 2nd meeting of the Course Can ISD Board of Trustees. This is a regular meeting and all items have been discussed that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in the public, it is not a meeting of the public. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policy and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, maintain a safe and secure environment, mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. And these are our core values. We appreciate your interest in the students of Course Canada ISD. The first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I think we were wondering if, Ethan, would you come up here and help us lead both of those tonight? All right, the next um, item on our agenda is the recognitions. First, we have valedictorian and the salutatorian.
Congratulations to all of you. Yes, we do. We hear that uh, Dr. Brown is a Eagle Scout as well. Right. Very exciting. What year was that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's way younger than me. I can assure you I wasn't. I probably was. Or a married with child, right? No, it's just in college. <laughs> All right, congratulations to all of you. The next item is the superintendent's report. We want to begin the superintendent's report by saying how very, very much that we appreciate our teachers. This is Teacher Appreciation Week, but we do appreciate them each and every day of the school year. And no time is um, te our teachers um, as important as the very end of the school year when everybody has to has to pull together and make it to the end and just dedicate themselves to finishing strong so we appreciate that we also thank our outstanding principals on um, Sunday I don't, I don't know why they made Sunday principal appreciation day but it was <laughs> so we also appreciate them there are frontline people every single day and um, they do everything they can to make wonderful learning environments and um, to help our district move our, move forward for our students we are excited to share that the first edition of our Roar magazine is out. We'll be putting those around the community, and we hope everybody enjoys this. It's just our opportunity to highlight some of the great programs, the great people, and the great alumni of Corsicana ISD. So because we don't want there to be barriers for any individuals who want to read our magazine, it's accessible to stakeholders um, with visual impairments. Um, it, the online magazine allows you to enlarge the text or listen to it in English. And we have a QR code also online so that you can see the magazine in Spanish. So we try to make um, it as comprehensively um, accessible as possible. Um, voting is underway. We have two more, well, this afternoon and tomorrow of early voting for our bond and for our um, board election. So we encourage everybody to go out and vote. And of course, the election day is this coming Saturday, May 7th. Uh, May 5th at 5 o'clock, we're going to host a meet and greet tentatively at Tiger Stadium. I looked right before I came into the board meeting. It's 98% chance of rain. So plan B will probably be the gym at the high school, but if that turns out to be the case, we'll be sure and get that information out there. Um, on May 5th also, um, there's the awesome 80s prom spring show. We encourage everybody to go. I think that's going to be a really fun event in the high school auditorium. And then May 13th through the 15th, the middle school is presenting Legally Blonde Junior um, at the Corsicana Middle School Commons, and you can purchase tickets um, at the door. If you're looking for a career, if you're job hunting, we hope you'll come out to the CISD job fair tomorrow at Corsicana Middle School from 515 to 615. We'll have um, people there representing all of our departments, and so whatever you might be interested in, um, we're interested in talking to you. Several of our students' artwork will be displayed for the next three weeks at the Region 12 Education Service Center. Um, we have students from the middle school, the high school, the intermediate school, and Carroll Elementary, whose artwork will be on display. So we encourage you, if you're in the Waco area, to stop by Region, Region 10 Education Service Center and see our students' artwork. The um, Academic Signing Day, this is a first ever for Corsicana ISD. It's going to be May 12th. We have over 70 seniors that have made their collegiate choices known, and it's going to be at 2 o'clock at the high school competition gym. So I think that's going to be a really exciting event. I want to especially thank um, Scott Doring and Megan Vadassi for um, having that idea and for organizing and making that happen. Great, okay, our first action items is a Colin scholarship update, and I'm gonna invite Casey Gordon's husband, Jared. If you know Casey, she was last year's Teacher of the Year, and it's gracing the cover of Roar, and she's, no offense, Jared, but she's prettier than you. She's uh, my much better half. Exactly, exactly. I will not argue that.
Casey, since he's the newbie, I'm just going to let him handle all of it. Okay, if you flip through uh, your, your portfolio packet, uh, this is a quarterly market update for the first quarter of the year, although you could say April is just a continuation of some of the challenges we're seeing. You'll see that throughout the report. You can read it at your own pleasure. Um, we've seen a lot of volatility in, in really all segments of the market, not just in the stock market, but also in the bond market. Uh, we were seeing that in commodities. Um, just a lot of inflation challenges that, that we face in the U.S. and in the economy. But the uh, one thing we will go over in this report is the glass half full, two of the items that benefit the Collins Scholarship interest rates. Uh, those have skyrocketed the last first four months of the year. And so we will see that. Uh, we expect to see that continue through the rest of 22. Uh, so as you uh, prepare to you know, come up with your plan for the upcoming scholarship program, you're going to have substantially more income, and we're going to talk to you about that. And then also on the oil and gas side, uh, we've all seen what's happened there. Uh, we're starting to see that reflected on the checks that we process on a monthly basis. Uh, I'm not expecting a, a bubble like we had back in 2011 when it really shot up, simply because production is, is nowhere near what it was then. Now, that doesn't mean if oil prices are sustained at this level, it's clearly going to benefit the fund, so we'll we'll highlight that as well. But if you flip forward to this report here, this is the actual performance review of the Collins plan. Uh, you see the ending balance for the first quarter of March, uh, ending balance of 19.4 million. Uh, looking at how that's broken out, uh, we've got just under 1.2 million in cash. About 846,000 of that is income cash that you do have available for uh, current and future scholarships. Um, and that, that number doesn't even include the roughly 550,000 that we took uh, over the first few months of this year and invested it in short duration securities. So needless to say, you've, you've got a lot of income cash and that number, we fully expect that number to continue to grow. Uh, looking at uh, your fixed income portfolio, uh, just over $7 million of that is invested in uh, U.S. government bonds, uh, investment-grade corporate bonds, CDs, and that's about 36% of the overall account. Uh, U.S. equities, um, that would be your large-cap individual stocks. Uh, the mid-cap sector and small-cap is about 10 point, uh, just under $10.8 million, which is about 55.5%. And then in international equities, it's over 700,000. I will say uh, just throughout the month of April, as rates continue to rise and with the volatility, that number has been skewed down. Uh, we were at about 58% in the quarter, whereas now we're at about 55%. And that's a number I think you'll see continue to drift down, uh, not only with the volatility in the stock market, but with where interest rates are at, it's a good time to readjust. And you're investment strategy has always been to range and scale from 40 to 60 percent uh, stocks of course over the last several years the stock market has been red hot so we've been right at that 60 percent mark now that we're seeing more value in bonds we started to shift more to a 50 50 strategy and so your overall income for the account uh, you began the year yielding on average about 170 because we've been in a low rate environment for several years uh, that's risen about 40 basis points, and I fully expect over the next six to nine months that number is only going to grow, so probably another 40 or 50 basis points. And so a lot of this income cash that you have there, you know, that 1.2 right now is earning about 30 basis points, whereas in the next two to three weeks, once the Fed does their ne next rate hike, you're going to be around 80 to 90 basis points. And they seem fully full steam ahead that number is likely going to continue to grow. And we saw this uh, about five years ago when, when the uh, money market fund was paying about 2.5%. And so I'm not saying we're going to hit that this year, but I bet we'll get close on this current path. Looking at page three, this is the uh, total portfolio and the returns for the first three months of the year. I know you you look at it, you wanted to see it on a calendar basis. There, the fiscal is also in there as well for that six-month period. 
The uh, total portfolio had a decline of negative 4.49% uh, versus a benchmark of negative 5.3. You can see across all the different segments uh, between the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, the Dow Jones total stock market, and the uh, international stock market, nothing's pretty right now. So <laughs> it, it, makes it makes it a challenge for us. Um, it's a challenge we certainly accept and welcome. Uh, but it is a challenge nonetheless, and, and we get a lot of these questions from customers right now. It's, it's not just exclusive to stocks. We've seen a lot of volatility in the bond market. Uh, we've seen the Treasury returns. The 10-year Treasury is down over 10% year-to-date. Um, the difference is on those types of bonds, we're holding those till they mature and you get your money back. So that's, that's always been our philosophy and will continue to be our philosophy. So you will see a number of securities in your portfolio that – I, I kind of wonder what I was thinking when we bought them at the time, but at the time we bought them, they looked a lot better. So, <laughs> so if you flip to page five, uh, this gives a more uh, a lengthier look at your portfolio. The last six months, the total portfolio does have a positive return of 186 versus the blended benchmark of a negative 0.48. And then the last 12 months of the last year, a 616 versus a 481 benchmark. And so th this is a new, we had partnered with this company called Informa for more advanced performance measurements. So this looks a lot different than the reports we've presented to you before. Um, I think you'll find as we look through this report, it, for one, it's a lot of information. It can give you a little bit of a headache, but I think it will help us as well as investors. Uh, and Casey's going to highlight some of those things that we can look at that are really going to help us. I think it'll help the fund continue to grow. And, and that's certainly all of our goal is to, continue to grow that fund. So save all your questions for him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I am on, just so everyone's caught up, I'm on page seven. First, we're gonna take a look at your semi-annual and cumulative returns. For your semi-annual semi -annual returns, they're stretched out along the x-axis in that bar chart. Uh, but what's really nice about this multigraph is that it actually shows you the cumulative effect of those returns. So you can see that on this subclass viewpoint that we actually, over the past 10 years, had a cumulative return of roughly 113% in comparison to the blended benchmark, which is roughly 111%. To the right, we have a simple pie chart that labels your portfolio subclasses as well as your asset allocation in each subclass. Those numbers are also transcribed below in the following table, which provides trailing return information on a three-month basis as well as a 10-year report period. I'm actually going to jump that table to page 9 and 10, which provides us additional return information. So on page 9, you'll notice that you have government bonds that make up about 16% of your overall portfolio. Similarly, you have United States corporate bonds that make up 12.95% of your portfolio. This is something that has become pretty standard, uh, of course, as, uh, as investment professionals as have stated, you know, as interest rates, rates were so tremendously low for the last uh, four or five years, we've had to go out further in terms of bond duration in order to maintain the same levels of yield. Now, moving downwards, I wanted to highlight the material sector. So this is one thing that I wanted to point out because these new reports, as Jared said, are going to make us better investors as well. And of course, we can visualize the cumulative effects of those investment decisions in the portfolio. The material sector is actually a perfect example of that. So if you look at this, you can see that we have underperformed uh, in the past year in the material sector. However, if you stretch that viewpoint out, we can provide a 10-year report period now to show that the material sector has actually provided returns of 12.48% in comparison to the index of 11.4% which is an entire percentage point more. As we get further into the packet, you're going to see another multigraph that's going to show you and help illustrate the effect of those compounding returns. Additionally, you can see that the laggard on page 9 was the communication services sector, which had a negative return of 11.93% for the past six months. The winning sector for the year was energy with a positive return of incredibly 64%, which is hard to say out loud. It sounds so wrong. But moving downwards, uh, I did want to 
jump to page 10 to highlight the information technology sector, which has been your best performing long-term sector. You can see that on the 10-year basis under the report period column, information technologies had a return of 22%, which beat the index by almost one and a half percentage points at 20.56%. At the bottom of that page, we also have our total portfolio return numbers, gross of fees, which is 1.86% for the last six months in comparison to the benchmark of 1.03%. Similarly, 6.16% for the past year in comparison to 5.83%. And then for the past 10 years, we have gross of fees return of 7.8% in comparison to the blended benchmark of 7.72%. If you were to put a star by any number, that's important that it's that's the most comparative or indicative of returns in comparison to the benchmark. In comparison to the benchmark, that would be the number. Now, flipping to page 11, we also have these new multi-graph reports, and these are really special because, uh, you know, they. <sighs> It's a new look at kind of the things that Jared and I think of. So, of course, for the Collins Fund, we are trying to mitigate risk. So when we look at the top right chart in investment efficiency, you can see that the blended benchmark is plotted by that gray square, whereas your portfolio is plotted by the black square. The goal is to be left of the square, which shows that you're taking less risk in your portfolio, and, of course, to be north of the square, which shows that you're basically making excess returns. So as you can see on the subclass viewpoint, we are actually northwest of that square, which shows that even despite having a safer portfolio, the portfolio has actually managed to generate additional returns. Now moving downwards, I wanted to point out on page 12, the materials sector yet again. You can see that over the past 10 years, the materials sector has actually, uh, has actually provided returns excess of 200% cumulative in comparison of roughly 195% to the index. Moving on to page 13, I wanted to point out another sector. Of course, you'll see on this page that we managed to outperform or match the index in each of the sectors on this page with the exception of healthcare. This is one of the areas that Jared was mentioning before where we can utilize this to make ourselves better investors. Looking back, we can see that the, the moat began to widen uh, probably around March or April of 2020. Of course, that's when COVID started. So similarly, we know that looking at this graph, it may be time to add a new name or to uh, maybe sell a loser in the healthcare sector. But we also know that you know, tracking past performance when we added Abby in 2020, that has helped us narrow the moat. As you can see that we are catching up in healthcare. Page 14 covers your ETF funds. There isn't much to note about this. Uh, in comparison to the index, they're going to match each other pretty similarly, and I would expect that to continue. Flipping to page 15, we have our top 10 holdings. You can see that cash sits at 6.11% of your overall market value, and that your highest individual holding is Apple at 3.29%. That is really just a testament to how well diversified this portfolio is. But additionally, we have on pages 15, 16, and 17, your taxable bond portfolio is spelled out. And then on pages 17 and 18, it includes your equity portfolio. Uh, with that being said, Jared is going to come up here and kind of discuss a little bit more about the income cash projection uh, that's going to, uh, of course, affect the upcoming scholarship season. This last page here is a letter I send to Dr. Frost, uh, typically on a semi-annual basis, just to give you as trustees an idea of what kind of income cash you have available for scholarships. And so we try to give you the best, most accurate prediction uh, as, as we can. I will say this time, usually we're a little conservative with income estimates, but because of how much you've accumulated and with the change in interest rates and how quickly that's rising along with your oil and gas income, we've, we've been much more aggressive. Uh, right now, you're, you're bringing in anywhere from fifteen dollars to $20,000 a month in oil and gas. Um, I certainly think that number is going to continue to rise. There's typically about a two to three month lag between what we're getting on checks processing versus what they're trading at in the oil market. And so we haven't totally seen the impact of when uh, oil 
prices really started to rise back in the late February, early March. And so you can see here, we're forecasting for the next, the next uh, fiscal year, for the next fiscal school year, your income to be uh, around 650,000. So you add that number on top of the 1.3 million that you have in available cash, you have a lot of money to, to spend. So <laughs> it's a good, it's a good and it's a good and bad problem. But I know you've got a good class of senior students, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions about that. We've really seen that number rise. I know when we met in January, I thought 500, 550,000 was a a good estimate and that number got blown out of the water pretty quickly so that's so a good good problem to have all right does anybody have any questions for jared i like the new layout personally yeah i like it a lot well, when we got the graphs i told casey it was up to him to learn how to talk about them <laughs> well he did a great so, job he, he's yeah. a youngster so yeah. he, that's he, right he got the nerd out on the grass that's right <laughs> that's right it's his job to help explain it to me <laughs> Well, like it. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, we've definitely diversified, so we know we can ride out any storm that comes to us, can't we? As, as bad as it is, you see, it's it, it can everything's on sale, storm. Jared. Everything's, yeah, everything's on sale. On sale. <laughs> yeah. so the glass half full as you look at the other exactly. side. Exactly. You income and you got a lot of it. Get so double you know, for your money. That's right. That's right. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Casey and Jared. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next um, action item is presentation of summer school plans. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Frost, and distinguished board members. I am here to present our continued summer learning plans for this summer for the 2022 school year. We will be starting um, summer school, pre-K and kindergarten bilingual summer school will be overseen by Ms. Verlina Bodie. Location will be at Bowie Elementary, and the first through fourth grade students will also be joining them at the same location for this summer. We're very excited to be able to offer a second year of our first through fourth grade summer school, which started right after COVID, and we are very thankful to be able to offer that again this year. This teachers will have a prep day for all, con or all grade level areas on May the 23rd. And then we will roll right into summer school. Now, the e bilingual EL summer school will start on Tuesday the 31st, right after Memorial Day. It'll run through the 22nd. It'll be every day, Monday through Thursday, from 7.30 to 3.30. Then all the other summer schools will be jumping in on the 24th. They will be running through the 16th. And we will obviously be closed in observance of Memorial Day on the 30th. They will also be going Monday through Thursday from 8 to 3.30. Nicholas Claiborne will be overseeing our first through fourth grade summer school. Uh, Shane Holcomb will be overseeing the fifth and sixth grade summer school. And at the secondary level, Ms. Brittany Mathis will be overseeing our seventh and eighth grade credit and attendance recovery. They will be located at the high school and they will run on the same dates as well. High school will continue to do credit recovery and attendance recovery. Ms. Tracy Griggs will be overseeing our um, turning points and ingenuity programs. And then we will be doing our STAR EOC retesting. Uh, Mr. Adrian Zamilpa will be over our STAR Blitz, which will take place for two weeks before the STAR testing, which will be June 6th through June 23rd. On June 21st through the 23rd, we will be doing all of our EOC, makeup te EOC tests as well as any makeup tests. And that week we will also be doing and launching our first summer enrichment camps called Camp Curiosity, which we will highlight next board meeting. We're very excited about that. In your board book, there is a breakdown of our program areas, um, the targeted areas that we will be working on. Um, some of the information is also repeated from the handout that I've um, given you. And then in addition, it kind of breaks down the amount of staffing that we're looking at for each area, as well as projected costs. Our numbers this year are much lower than what they have been in the past, so we are excited about that. And I've spoken with Molly Pointon, who's um, overseeing our bilingual and EL summer school. Both of us are fully staffed already for both areas, which we are extremely thankful for that. Our teachers have stepped up. Uh, in fact, we have extra teachers in the queue ready to work if we have the spots for them. So what we're able to do this year, which we are also very thankful for, is to be able to widen our opportunities for students who need to come to summer school um, and be able to offer extra opportunities. And so those numbers may go up a little bit so that we can get students in who might just want a little extra um, for continued summer learning. So that is um, the basic information. Do you have any questions for me? 
Do I have any questions for Ms. Holcomb? I do want to highlight one thing that Kim just said because I think it's really important is that um, a lot of times that you think of summer school as students who have failed the grade, but what we wanted to do this year, because we do have the funds and it's for student achievement, is if there are students and their parents say, you know, I feel like that when I met with the teacher, the reading wasn't where it needed to be. I really, I'm interested in my child coming to summer school. That we, the answer, we want the answer to be yes. We want to encourage all the students that have, whose parents have any questions, or if they just want them to come to summer school, to come because for once in our lives, we have the money to pay for that, and this is a good opportunity to enrich and right. and extend learning for all of our kids. How many students, uh, or how many? So how many students per teacher do we anticipate for like our elementary level? For class sizes? Grade? Yeah. Class sizes are going to be, we try to do no more than 10. Um, and some of these areas will be having less than 10, maybe more like eight per teacher. Okay. Uh, we want it to be as small as group as possible to really be able to do um, extra things with them and give them the extra time and attention that's needed. So we are really, really thankful that our numbers are low, that we can then have extra teachers to make those class sizes even smaller. I have a question. Um, Turn on your microphone, guys. Regarding the parents, I mean, I know we focus on the kids for summer school. What can we do to involve our parents as far as getting some type of communication with them during the summer? Because I know we try to have parent meetings and stuff during the fall, but how can we capture them during the summer to maybe have some type of parent-type meetings, you know, in case they have any questions or preparing them for the fall, I mean, just something to capture them during the summer, right. you know. So at the campus level, um, they are going to be, of course, there's parent letters that will be going home for the students that have to come or the ones that are wanting to come. Um, in addition, each of the campus administrators at those campuses can reach out and do campus kind of um, parent engagement type activities at those schools. Um, it could look different at each level as far as what that might look like. Um, this summer, we are actually doing with our June 21st through 23rd camps, we are going to be doing a um, presentation as well as um, uh, there will be performances or presentations for each of the camps. And so those will actually involve our parents to be able to come up to the schools and to be able to see the things that we're doing. And so we're very thankful to be able to offer that extra camp, which was part of our ESSER funding that came out of our planning uh, last summer. And that will be something new this year that will be a little bit more parent involvement than we've had in the past. Um, in addition to increased communication that will need to go home, of course, to involve all of them. Um, students who are not coming to summer school, we will have extended learning opportunities that they can do at home. We will have things on our website as well as things that they can reach out and do through Canvas. Um, we always send home flashcards and things of that nature for additional summer reading and summer activities. And so if there's something that they can't maybe come to the school for or don't want to come to the school for, we'll have activities that they can do at, that, at home. And um, we have free literature that we're, we're going to be sending home this summer as well. Uh, for students to have a literature in their houses. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, thank you so much. All right, the next item is the technology department report. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Frost, and distinguished members of the board. The purpose of this meeting is to update all of our stakeholders of the existing status of our technology program and provide insight as it relates to digital readiness, infrastructure, and upcoming initiatives. So we have a framework that we go by in our technology department. First of all, it's connecting the learner, ensuring that there's access to all of our students, uh, whether that's students, teachers, and staff, uh, promoting literacy, developing skills for students and staff for online blended and technology mediated classroom instruction uh, leveling the playing field uh, we take this very seriously we uh, want to have equal access to all the content using accessibility standards and adaptive and assistive technology and then me measuring our impact we use data tools and techniques to measure our learning and provide accountability and documentation um, including measuring our remote learner so this will um, keep us up to date of what we need to do and how we need to move forward so I just wanted to highlight a few things that we've uh, done this year during the 21-22 year. Um, what we decided as a district was to differentiate the type of device depending on the student and the grade level. 
So for pre-K and kindergartners, we decided that, and we talked to teachers and, and principals, that they wanted iPads. So we did that with uh, the Emergency Connectivity Fund as well as ESSER funds, and pre-K and kinder all now are one-to-one -one with iPads. Uh, first grade through eighth grade all have Dell 3310 laptops, and then our CH students will have Dell 7480 laptops available next year. So that laptop for the high school kids, they talked to us last spring and they talked to us about how this Dell 3310 was not, uh, wasn't appropriate for them. They needed something a little bit with a little bit more bang, a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more oomph for them. So we did, we went out, we used our ECF money, our emergency con con connectivity fund, and we did that. So they'll have a better laptop next year and we're really excited about that. Uh, Carbon Black is our endpoint security, which has been installed on all of our devices. This tool provides ransomware and malware pr protection while facilitating threat hunting and incident response. So this helps us figure out really quick if we have an issue with a, a laptop or something that's coming through, whether it's ransomware and malware. Uh, our data center is a 10 gig network upgrade. It is complete. Uh, this year we'll be um, updating the server and once that's done, our server and our data center is completely updated and we'll not have to do that for let's say seven to 10 more years. Uh, Carol and Sam Houston have received all Dell, brand new Dell 3310 laptops. They went from a 3180 or a 3190 to a 3310. And this is part of our first phase of our, of our replacement cycle. And it may seem really early for our replacement cycle, but it's really not. We're able to use a lot of our ESSER funds to update our laptops and we'll continue to do that through the 22-23 school year. And Carol and Fannin have received a network equipment upgrade that will provide a 10 gig bandwidth to accommodate the growing number of our devices. So those are just a few highlights for this year. And then what will we do this summer? Um, so we're gonna, all the laptops will be re-imaged by our technology department. Uh, they'll reinstall Windows 10 at all elementary, Collins, and middle school campuses. And this will ensure our devices are ready to work um, in August and they can have the best experience for the students. A device inventory, we work on this every year. It's an inventory audit. We conduct this on each campus and we verify that the device is present and uh, named correctly and that it's on the correct campus. Um, and then Wi-Fi access point refresh for Sam Houston. They will receive 32 new Wi-Fi, six capable access points which will be installed and will take out the older equipment. And then we're also, uh, introducing class link next year. So that'll be our new single sign-on solution. We currently use Hello ID, but the class link will work better with some of our programs that Hello ID is not able to do that. So it's a better end user, it's a better end user experience for both our staff and our students. And then Collins projector refresh. So Collins Intermediate will receive 58 new Promethean boards, and we will take out the old boards, and they will all receive 58 new Promethean boards, and then Meredith Boyd will uh, train all the staff this summer. Austin's also here, so if you have any questions for Austin or I, we are happy to answer those questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. As far as, you know, I know pre-K and kindergarten were one-to-one -one with iPads, but how are we with first grade through eighth grade on computers? They are all in one as well. Um, some, some, sometimes two to one. So they, the first grade through eighth grade all have a, a laptop. So it, let's say middle school. So what we did in the fall or spring, January, um, we realized that middle school students were having a lot of trouble with them bringing back the actual you know, device when they needed it so if the teacher was gonna use it. So we decided to buy 56 carts. Each teacher has a cart. All those students use those laptops inside the classroom. However, if a teacher wants to send the laptop home with a student, for we have those to check out as well. So they actually don't take those home from K through eight, but they do have one to one on each campus, and they also have desktops in their classrooms. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. All right, the next item is staff development minutes waiver. We're requesting tonight that the board approve uh, expedited staff development uh, minutes waiver. What we would do in this case is to count the staff development day on January 30th and um, receive those minutes so that we could do early release on May, 
May 20th, which is our last day of school. All right, do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, all right, I have a motion. All in favor of the submission of the expedited application for staff development minutes to TEA for the 2021-2022 school year. All in favor? Aye. All right, that passes. Next item is the board planning calendar for 22-23. We have the board planning calendar draft, and so I wanted to include this in your board book so you could have a chance to review that, and then we'll um, have a discussion, make any modifications that you see that need to be made, or any recommendations that you might have um, at the next board meeting. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? Again, this is just um, for this workshop, and it'll be improved later. Do we have any questions? If not, I'm going to adjourn this and we will adjourn into closed session as permitted by Texas Government Code Section 551.01.